This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. Humanism is a progressive worldview that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of our staff or board of directors. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Kyla Lee. She's going to be talking about, should we fear drug-impaired drivers? Kyla Lee is a partner at Acumen Law Corporation in Vancouver, BC. Her practice focuses on impaired driving and roadside drug and alcohol testing. She's deeply concerned by new measures to be to be put in place by the government to address drug impaired driving and has been a outspoken public advocate against putting regulation before science and research. Please welcome Kyla. Okay, hi. hi. So yeah, I was asked to come here to talk about uh, whether we should fear drug impaired drivers and in particular some changes that are coming down the pipes to drug impaired driving laws in Canada. But what's really interesting about the changes to the drug impaired driving laws that we have is that they start with changes to alcohol impaired driving and I found that fascinating. When the federal government introduced Bill C-46, which is a companion bill to C-45, which legalizes cannabis, they created a whole ton of changes to the alcohol impaired driving regime that we've had in this country for, I don't know, 50, 100 years? I couldn't give you a date, but um, so that's the uh, a very interesting thing. So we're seeing three significant changes to alcohol impaired driving. One is the introduction of random breath testing. And it's something that everybody needs to know about because even if you don't drink, and even if you don't drink and drive, you still need to know about a random breath testing because now, anytime the police pull you over, they can ask you to provide a breath sample into a roadside breathalyzer and uh, you are required to comply. There's a penalty, a criminal charge for refusing to blow. So if you don't comply with the demand, you could end up facing a one-year driving prohibition a $1,000 fine and a criminal record and that's a mandatory consequence on a first conviction. A second conviction is mandatory jail. Um, so never refuse. <laughs> uh, but I had to ask when I looked at this why were they introducing random breath testing? It was something that was often tabled uh, in the House of Commons as a private members bill. Frequently, the government was uh, was voting it down, saying that it's not constitutionally valid. So now, why was the Liberal majority government putting this in as what Jody Wilson-Raybould called the centerpiece of this legislation? And I finally figured it out. The answer is that they want random breath testing to make it easier to look for drug-impaired drivers. Because the type of behavior that you see from somebody who is high while driving is not actually anything that poses a risk on the road. They've done a ton of studies on this in other countries. Um, there's, I think, one in Sweden where they put people on the road in one of those cars with two steering wheels so that they could take over and had them drive in actual road conditions while they were high. And they measured the accident risk. And they found that for cannabis Im impaired drivers, people who had, had consumed cannabis, there was no increased risk of accident. It was a one-to-one -one ratio. It was about the same as being 22 to 25 and male. Uh, that was the same accident risk you would have. So uh, it, it wasn't something that caused any problem. And to look at somebody who has smoked or consumed cannabis, you can't really tell that they're high unless you're interacting with them a little more and you notice their responses are maybe a little slow, something seems off and you don't really know what it is. But in the context of a roadside stop, when police are dealing with people and when police are interacting with drivers, you don't have that same uh, opportunity to interact with them because the interaction is required to be short. I've pulled you over because I saw you weaving in your lane, which is one of the things that people who are on cannabis will do. They'll weave within their lane, but not leave it, just within it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I pulled you over because you were weaving within your lane. Can I see your license and your insurance documents? Can you state your name and address? And beyond that, the police don't really have that much more power without more to get people involved in an investigation into their sobriety. It starts to become an arbitrary detention and then violates Section 9 of the Charter, or it starts to infringe on people's right to counsel and violate Section 10B of the Charter. 
So why random breath testing? So that they can take people out of the car, give them a breathalyzer, engage with them for longer, and then if there's something's off about them but you can't really tell what, and they pass the breathalyzer, then you can say, well, I suspect they have a drug in their body. So it's actually a shortcut to allow the police to get to the drug impaired driving investigation. Another introduction uh, that we're seeing is a new per se limit uh, for uh, blood alcohol concentration. What a per se limit refers to is the amount of something that you can have in your body before you're considered to be legally impaired. So for alcohol, everybody knows 0.08. Well, right now the law says above 0.08. So if you're 0.09, then you're in trouble. But if you're at 0.08, that's okay. You can keep driving, except in BC where it's 0.05 for provincial purposes, but for criminal purposes, 0.08. But they're actually lowering it from above 0.08 to at or above 0.08. So they're technically dropping the criminal legal limit for alcohol by 10 milligrams of alcohol and 100 milliliters of blood. Um, and they're increasing the mandatory minimum penalties for certain uh, impaired driving offenses. Um, they have also created a whole new list in the criminal code of things that judges have to consider when sentencing somebody for impaired driving. So right now, um, in the criminal code for certain offenses, there's a list of things that are considered aggravating on sentence. There are things that make your crime worse. For impaired driving, the only statutorily aggravating factor is having a blood alcohol concentration of twice the legal limit, so uh, 160 instead of 80. Uh, they're now creating a list of about 10 different factors that judges are required to consider as making your conduct worse. I mean, some of them are obvious, like if you injure somebody or kill somebody or if you're in an accident. Those are things that judges were already taking into account anyway. But they're also uh, creating a new aggravating high blood alcohol concentration of 120. Now, I do a lot of practice in the area of impaired driving, and it's very rare to see right now impaired driving charges for people who are at 120. Usually those cases are, are dealt with administratively, um, and in British Columbia in particular, we often don't charge people uh, criminally with impaired driving unless their blood alcohol readings are a minimum of 100, even though 80 is the limit. Um, so 120 is not that much higher than what we just generally do in BC anyway. And so to lower it to 120 is actually going to create a whole swath of, of higher sentences for people that up until, well, up until October 17th coming up, um, we're going to get perfectly regular mandatory minimum penalties. So this is going to have a hugely disproportionate effect on people for conduct that for years hasn't really been been that much of a concern um, beyond the regular obvious concerns about impaired driving. Um, when random breath testing was uh, introduced, there was a huge debate sparked about its constitutional validity. And the reason for that is that in Canada, we have um, rules about when the police can take bodily samples from you. It's one of the great things about this country is we have a charter. And breath testing, roadside breath testing was already determined by the Supreme Court of Canada to be constitutionally invalid. And there's not just one case that says that, there's like four um, since it was first introduced. So we have cases um, from 1988, cases from the 90s, cases from the early 2000s, even recent Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence in 2015 has commented on the constitutional validity of these sections. But we also, in Canadian constitutional law, have something called Section 1 of the Charter, which uh, essentially says if something's constitutionally invalid, but there's a really good reason to have it, and the government can justify the infringement of your charter rights, then we can excuse, uh, excuse a violation of, of the Constitution. And that's exactly what's the case with roadside breath testing. The courts have said, because it violates the Constitution, but it's not used as evidence in court, it's only used to give the officer grounds to arrest, and because it's done immediately, so there's no huge infringement on people's right to counsel, and because it's done on the basis of police officers at least meeting a minimum standard of reasonably suspecting there is alcohol in a person's body, we can excuse this 
because the public safety purpose of this legislation is so significant. We know about the carnage that impaired driving causes, alcohol impaired driving, I should say, causes on the roads and, and highways, and we have to be able to empower police to do something about it. So when this bill was introduced, um, the constitutional validity of roadside breath testing became a huge point of debate. When the bill went to the Senate, the Senate actually voted to remove the random breath testing provisions. And then when it kicked back to the House, the House was like, nope, we want them back. And uh, it was now basically a couple days before they all went on their summer vacation. So they passed it as a whole uh, with the provisions. But warning, um, I as a criminal defense lawyer, like the warning from Senator Batters, who said that this is going to be Christmas for defense lawyers, um, which truly it will be, but it also is going to just tie up the courts with constitutional litigation across the country, um, probably starting October 18th. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. Um, I've talked about some of these already. Um, there are also uh, changes to the Motor Vehicle Act that come in at the same time. So in British Columbia, we have uh, provincial legislation dealing with impaired driving. And I don't know if many of you have heard about our immediate roadside prohibition scheme. Basically, if you fail a roadside breathalyzer, you get taken off the road for 90 days um, and you lose your car for 30 and there's fines and penalties and courses you have to take to be able to get your license back. Uh, it's been a lot of uh, debate again over the constitutionality of that. There have been four separate constitutional challenges. So when cannabis legalization came around, of course, there was this uproar. What are we going to do about our roads and highways? And I've always found that uproar to be incredibly amusing because it acts as though cannabis is being invented on October 17th and it's not. People have been smoking cannabis and eating cannabis and dabbing and I, I mean I don't know other ways to to use it but I'm sure other people here do um, for hundreds of years in this country and then people have been getting into cars and driving and we've done nothing to enforce existing drug-impaired driving laws at a very significant rate. And we also haven't really seen that many drug-impaired drivers just taking out people willy-nilly. It's not like alcohol, where it is a huge problem, and you can see the connection because you can see the impairment. And so when the uproar started about legalization and then what are we going to do about our roads and highways, of course the provincial government had to get involved too. And so they've created a new framework for dealing with uh, cannabis impaired driving at the provincial level. And that's in Bill 17. And I believe that passed middle of May uh, of this year and it'll come into force and effect around the same time as cannabis legalization. And then of course we have federally the uh, Bill C-46, the Impaired Driving Act. So the federal consequences that we're going to see with changes to cannabis impaired driving are very interesting and incredibly troubling. And I have a lot of concerns about them. Um, the first is a presumption of accuracy in relation to the drug recognition evaluation. I don't know how many people are familiar with the DRE. It is a 12 step program. After you're arrested, once the police have reasonable grounds to believe that you are impaired by a drug um, and they arrest you, they take you back to the police detachment and they put you through this 12-step physical coordination program. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about it. I'm going to pass this around. Um, this is the card. It's the cheat sheet card that the police use. Um, I managed to get my hands on a copy uh, from Texas, but it's all the same training regardless of where you are. And it tells, there's a little chart on the back here that tells you the different, there's seven categories of drug that they will look for, and it tells you what symptoms will be exhibited based on those categories. So you can go along and you can go, this is present, this is present, this is present, they must be on a, a, a depressant or on PCP. I don't know why you would need an evaluation to know that somebody's on PCP, but apparently they do. Um, and I want you to pay particular attention when I pass this around to the column for cannabis. So the drug recognition evaluation um, involves these 12 steps. The very first step in the official NHTSA training for this program is an interview. We don't do the interview in Canada. 
And the reason we don't do the interview is it's a criminal offense to refuse to participate in the drug recognition evaluation program. And if you engage in an interview with a person, they're not required to tell you anything. The only circumstance in law where you're required to provide information is your identity. Um, and in the Motor Vehicle Act, your license and insurance and who's the registered owner of the vehicle and their address. But um, you don't have to provide information about what you drank or what drugs you took or anything like that. And to make it a criminal offense to refuse to take the drug recognition evaluation program, they had to take out the interview. The people who teach the drug recognition evaluation program will tell you something about the interview. It's really the only step you need. Because, and I can, I can confirm this is true, when people are asked by police, what drugs did you take and how much and when, they are incredibly forthcoming. And I don't know why, because you don't have to be. But they love to tell the police what they took and when and how much and how often. And uh, I, I mean, I've, I've represented people who've said the most appalling things that, you know, and after they've contacted me and I've said, don't say what you took and when, um, they go ahead and do it anyway. Um, so it's actually the most reliable indicator for a police officer what somebody's on. And if I asked, you know, if I asked you, what medication are you taking? And you tell me, oh, yeah, well, I have uh, ADHD and so I take Ritalin. Well, I'm going to go, all right, now I'm going to interpret the results of my test because I know he's on a stimulant. And so you look for the things that confirm that somebody is on a stimulant. So that interview portion being taken out makes the drug recognition evaluation program that much less reliable. The program itself was developed through a series of validation studies. And when they started creating this program, it, was, it began in the 60s and into the 70s. It was officially created in the 80s. But they were, uh, it was the California Highway uh, Police that were doing it. And they would go down to the beaches in California and they would find people who were experimenting on whatever drugs they could find. And they would drag them off the beach and say, hey, let's do a fun thing. We want to see if we can figure out what drugs you're on. And so they went and found these people who are experimenting with drugs who are whacked out of their minds um, and they did the validation by using the the results of the tests with those individuals so it was a, a very flawed method to create the program in Canada we're creating something called a presumption of accuracy in relation to the drug recognition evaluation program so what happens is you go through the 12 steps at the end of the 12 steps the officer has to form an opinion and the opinion is either the person is not impaired by a drug, spoiler alert, that never happened, um, or at least I've never seen it. <laughs> um, alternatively, uh, the person is impaired, but it's by a medical condition. Again, that never happens. Um, but what always seems to happen is the person is impaired by a drug, and then they identify what class or category, using their little cheat sheet, of drugs they think it is. And they're also allowed to pick more than one. So you can say, I think they're impaired by cannabis and. So if you have two that provide contrary evidence, they just cancel each other out, and that's how people can be impaired by two drugs and not actually be on any drugs. Um, hence why it never happens that you get a, I don't think they're impaired actually, result. So they form their opinion, they identify the class or category of drugs that they think is impairing the person, and then they do a blood or a urine draw. Now currently, what happens when the police do this is they bring that evidence to the court, they have the evidence of the blood or the urine test. We don't have right now per se limits for blood drug concentrations. So the Crown still has to argue that all of this taken together, the performance on the test, the officer's observations of driving behavior, any statements that were made by your client anyway, um, despite the, the absence of a mandatory interview, and any other information, like maybe a civilian report about driving behavior or something like that, is all taken together, and the court weighs it and assesses whether or not they think that this supports uh, guilt and uh, conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. After October 17th, that whole weighing by the court isn't necessary, because if the officer says, I think that you're impaired by cannabis, and then you're blood or your urine test, I'm going to get to those, come back and you have cannabis or THC is what they're testing for, um, metabolites of THC in your blood or your urine, then it is presumed for the purposes of conviction that you were impaired and that you were impaired by that drug. So no need to prove that the person was actually impaired, the law already says you were. 
And it doesn't matter the concentration of THC or any other drug in your system or in your urine. It's just if it's there, the presence of it plus the DRE opinion is enough to support a conviction. This is said to be in the absence of evidence to the contrary, but nothing in the law describes what evidence to the contrary is. Is it calling your friend Bill who says, man, I've seen him smoke way more than that and drive perfectly. He's not impaired by that much cannabis. Or is it, which used to actually be how you could defeat an impaired driving charge. You could say two beers wouldn't impair me. And you could call a toxicologist to say that your blood alcohol level wouldn't have been over the limit based on your weight and elimination, absorption, all these factors. And you could win. And the, the law was amended in eight to eliminate that defense. So uh, we don't know what evidence the contrary is going to look like. It's just these words, these meaningless, ambiguous words in the legislation that have yet to be, uh, to be assessed. The law also allows the police to take your blood at the police station or anywhere else. There's no limits on where the police can take your blood. It used to be, um, and it still is until October 17th, that if you wanted to have a blood sample taken from a person for your impaired driving investigation, you had to get them to a hospital, you had to have a qualified technician supervised by a qualified medical practitioner to draw the blood and take the blood sample, but not anymore. Now they've eliminated that requirement um, and they're making police officers qualified technicians. I wouldn't panic too much about that happening because the police officers that I've spoken to have said, oh no, I'm not taking somebody's blood. And I mean, going back to the guy on PCP that you don't need to be evaluating to know that he's on a drug, I'm not sticking a needle into somebody who I think might be on PCP because that will not end badly for me. PCP, if you don't know, um, it's like an early anesthetic. Um, and so they used to use it in medical procedures to knock people out. Unfortunately, they found that people woke up and because they had developed an effective intolerance to any pain, really bad things happened. Um, so that's why people on PCPs are able to lift cars and bend jail cell bars and do all these things. It's because their body no longer feels any pain, but they're completely conscious. Um, they do feel pain when the PCP wears off and they realize they've broken like four bones in their arms, but they don't up until that point. So you don't want to be poking a needle into somebody in those circumstances because you're going to end up with a needle in your eye. Um, so it's probably going to be urine testing, which in and of itself poses significant problems. I know an officer who's now blind um, because of a situation involving urine. I won't get into the gory details at a uh, police station. I also know an officer who um, he doesn't have a spleen, so he's got some underlying medical issues. He'd been injured and lost his spleen in an accident, and um, he ended up getting some very serious illnesses from handling the urine, doing the drug recognition evaluation training. So it is a significant problem to have police handling these samples and to do it in a non-sterile environment that's not a hospital. So I don't know why the government thought that they would do this. It only exposes everybody to significant risk uh, to their life and to their health. Um, but they thought that that would be easier, I suppose. Yes. Oh yeah, take a picture, do. Um, we're also introducing per se limits uh, for various blood drug concentrations. I'm gonna come to those. So the drug recognition evaluation program, I've sort of talked a bit uh, about this. The tests are also not specific to any one drug. And the majority of the tests are not exactly very scientific physical coordination or cognitive tests. The majority of the tests are things like measuring your blood pressure. Well, measuring your blood pressure may indicate that somebody's on a drug. And certainly some drugs will elevate or lower your blood pressure, but having high blood pressure might also mean you have hypertension. It might mean you're under a lot of stress, which is not surprising because people who have been arrested and are accused of being impaired by a drug are probably going to be a little bit stressed out. Um, you can have low blood pressure from being underweight. You can have high blood pressure from being overweight. I mean, your weight can impact the results of the drug recognition evaluation test. Uh, they also measure your pulse. And I'm sure everybody knows that your pulse rate can vary based on your situation. You have people who have uh, really work out a lot and do a lot of exercise and their resting pulse rate is a lot lower than mine, which is really high because like if I have to walk up a flight of stairs, I need a break. Um, 
and you have individuals who have high pulse rates again because of stress and anxiety. So all of a sudden your pulse rate is up, you're freaking out, oh my gosh, this officer thinks I'm on drugs, and now he's manhandling me, he's taking my pulse, he's putting a blood pressure cuff on me, he's measuring my temperature. Your body reacts to stress, and it reacts with your temperature and your blood pressure and your pulse, the things that the drug recognition evaluation me measures. Another aspect of the drug recognition evaluation program that they, uh, that they test, and you can see on the back of the card that's going around, is they look at your pupil size and your pupil reaction to light. Now pupil size too can be affected by a lot of things. And they do three different pupil examinations. The first one that they do is called room light. Now there's no standardized, this is supposed to be a standardized test by the way, but there's no standardized definition of what room light is. And I mean, even in this room, I'm in different lighting conditions than everyone at this table or those people over there. Everybody is in different lighting conditions because of their proximity to the various light sources. And there's different types of light sources. We have the lovely overhead fluorescent lights. We have the nice big open windows. We have the light coming off the projector screen. All of these different light sources are going to impact your pupil size. Now on the back of that card going around the, is the pupil size measuring guide, which they call a pupillometer. I see a lot of people in the room wearing glasses, which means a lot of people in the room have probably gone to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist and had an evaluation of your eyes. And if you did, you probably saw all sorts of gadgets and gizmos and instruments. You probably used them, I don't know, I've like last went when I was like six, so I have vague memories of this. But a pupillometer is a big instrument. It's not a piece of paper that they literally take that card and hold it up next to your eyes and go, yeah, I think it's this one, and use the measurement that way. Not only is that not how you would do a scientific measurement or much less a measurement to get an evaluation of somebody's health or fitness ever, but it's also not a pupillometer, and yet they call it that. Um, and then they say that your pupils are either dilated or constricted, constricted would be narcotics and dilated would be cannabis, for example, based on their results on that card. But we're talking differences of half a millimeter on the different measurements on the card. Can you guesstimate with, a, with no inaccuracy half a millimeter? No. I can't, I can't. Uh, and I don't think many people can. I mean, there might be some like really savants in that area, but I am not, and I, I think the majority of people are not. So this is the science that goes behind the drug recognition evaluation. The second pupil exam that they do is they put you in a completely dark room. So as if your blood pressure and your pulse rate wasn't high enough, now you go in a completely dark room with the police officer. And what they're supposed to do, once they've got you in the dark room, is wait 90 seconds. So you're standing, without knowing what's going on, 90 seconds in total darkness with a police officer who thinks that you're on drugs, or as a police officer with a guy you think is on drugs, or woman. Um, the, and, and that's a huge, uh, a huge concern because the next thing they do after that is another check of your pulse just to make sure that you're totally fine. Um, so they measure your pupil size in near uh, total darkness and then they, um, they shine a light close to your face and measure the reaction of your pupil to the light as they go back and forth. So those are the three pupil examinations. But you're not going to get accurate results because it's not a scientific measurement. And again, they're you know, in the dark trying to use this card trying to measure your pupil size. You're not going to get a good, uh, a good result. Now the only physical coordination tests that form part of the drug recognition evaluation are the steps of the standardized field sobriety test. And those are the three tests, you've probably seen them if you've watched an episode of Cops. Uh, the first one is the one leg stand where you stand on one leg for 30 seconds and uh, don't fall over. Don't use your arms to balance and also uh, you have to keep your eyes closed. If you know anything about balance, there are three things that go into balance. One is your inner ear. Uh, the other is your position of your legs and your distribution of your weight, and the other is your eye line. And you're taking away two of those things and then saying, can you balance? Science says that balance requires two of the three. So let's take away two of the three and see how well you do. Um, those tests are very difficult to be performed by people who are overweight um, because your distribution of your weight is different. People who have any injuries to their legs or their knees, um, obviously because you're taking away one of their legs. Um, people in unusual footwear, try doing that in stilettos. It's not going to work very well. 
Um, the second one uh, is called the uh, walk the line, and that's the take nine heel to toe steps and then turn around and take nine heel to toe steps back. And most people, when they see it on TV, they see this and they think that's what you're supposed to do. That's not the test. The test is, they tell you first, to start and put your foot in the position. And then you have to stand there with your arms at the sides, and I'm having trouble right now, uh, without falling over, while they tell you the, and demonstrate the rest of the test for you. So you have to stand in this position, and if you fall over while they're doing the instructions, that's considered against you. So you stand like this for a few minutes while they explain it all to you, and then you start. And it's nine heel to so steps, counted out loud, and that's heel touching toe. Nine times, not using your arms for balance, and then you have to do a special turn, which is like this, and then back, and nine heel to toe steps back. Not many people can accomplish that sober. I can't do it. I've never been able to do the turn right. I'm pretty sure I screwed it up just now too. Um, but that's what they require you to do. And then the third one uh, is the horizontal gaze and stagmus test. That's where they do the pen and the eyes and they track your eye movement back and forth. What they're looking for is involuntary jerking of the eye. This test is a complete misnomer because involuntary jerking of the eye does not happen with cannabis. All of the studies that have found that impairment and involuntary jerking of the eye are related relate to blood alcohol concentration. They say they can correlate when your angle of onset of nystagmus occurs with a particular blood alcohol concentration. So the sooner you see the nystagmus, the higher your blood alcohol level is. That's also kind of been debunked, um, although there is some connection, but it's not like a, a partition ratio for blood alcohol concentration. So they do that. Cannabis does not impair your ability to do any of those things. Nystagmus is not present for cannabis. Um, and so you would not have any issues. You would not have any problems with your balance with cannabis. You would perform normally on all of those tests. And as you've been looking at the card that I passed around, you probably noticed that in the column for cannabis, it's normal, 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 none, none, none. So basically, if you go through the drug recognition evaluation and you seem fine, they're gonna conclude you're impaired by cannabis. The test is designed to lead to the conclusion that somebody is impaired by a drug, it's just which drug are they gonna pick? So that is a, uh, a big problem. And that's the only real physical coordination. There's one other that they do, which is the, uh, the, the touch the tip of your nose with your finger test. That, they make you stand feet together, head back, uh, arms out to your sides, and they go left, right, left, right, right, left. That pattern change to trick you. Um, and you're supposed to touch the very tip of your finger. They don't tell you this in the instructions, by the way. The very tip of your finger to the very tip of your nose. If you touch the pad of your finger to the top of your nose, that's not good enough. And uh, when I first did this test, I listened to the instructions, I was trying to do it right, and I did not get my nose once. I touched the pad of my finger to my nose every time. I knew where my nose was, it was fine. But I did not touch the very tip of my finger to the very tip of my nose because I wasn't told to do that. And so I failed the test. Now they won't trick me. <laughs> um, so the blood testing uh, I've talked about, but there's one other thing that's really interesting about the blood testing. The criminal code says that the police are required to take two samples of your blood in any impaired driving investigation, the alcohol or drugs. Two samples. One sample they send off to the forensic lab for testing. It's on Heather Street in Vancouver, and it you know comes back with whatever result it comes back with. The second sample is for you. You can apply to the court and you can say, I need this sample released to me for independent testing. The problem with that is that the criminal code now has a provision that says if they don't take two, it's okay. They don't actually have to take two. They're supposed to take two, but there's no remedy if they don't. So if you don't get your opportunity to independently test your blood or your urine sample to determine whether the police tests were done right and whether they were accurate, that doesn't matter. The one safeguard to the testing process that we used to have has been written away. Um, and there's a huge issue with blood and urine testing for delay. As we all know, justice delayed is justice denied. We also know, or well, I know, and now you all know, that the driving prohibitions in British Columbia that are gonna come into effect for drug impaired driving start seven days later. But it's 119 days right now for a blood sample result from the lab. 
Add in all the new blood tests they're going to be doing because of all the drug recognition evaluation tests that are going to be going on and all the new testing that's going to be happen. The lab's going to be flooded. That delay is only going to increase. You're not actually going to get the evidence you need to show that your driving prohibition should be revoked until after your driving prohibition is long since over. And so everybody's going to end up serving their 90 days without the evidence to show that they're innocent because of huge delays. It's going to be quite literal example of justice delayed being justice denied. Um, there's also problems with the reliability of testing samples a significant amount of time after you take them, like anything. You, know, you take your blood, your blood is supposed to be in your body. If you take it out, it's going to degrade over the time. The same way you might keep your milk in your fridge, but you're not drinking it in a month. Uh, you're, <laughs> you know, your blood's going to spoil the same way, even if it's kept in, in the fridge. And so the reliability of the blood testing results decreases. I've talked to some toxicologists who say that after 90 days, they shouldn't be doing any testing for uh, blood samples because the reliability of that testing is too flawed at that point. Um, you can also see with blood, uh, if it's not stored in proper conditions, that it's not going to be um, it's not going to be reliable. You can see fermentation of blood samples that can lead to unreliable results, particularly in relation to alcohol. It's where everything that's in your body already, yeast and all of those things, break down the sugars, and your body, your blood will produce its own alcohol, which can elevate a blood alcohol uh, reading significantly. And we don't know. There's so many unknowns here. We don't know how that's going to look when it comes to cannabis. We don't know what happens to blood with THC in it when there's fermentation or when there's other issues, what can increase THC concentrations in blood samples. Um, which brings me to per se limits for cannabis. We're creating new criminal offenses in Canada for having a certain blood drug concentration. So cannabis, uh, there's two offenses. There's a summary offense, which is a um, sort of considered less serious and has different penalties available, but it still results in a mandatory criminal record for two and a half nanograms of cannabis in your uh, body. And if you want to think about like how much is that, what does that look like? Two cubes of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool is the concentration we're talking about. So such a minute amount of THC in your system. And the federal government has even said, we know that two and a half nanograms doesn't impair or negatively affect anybody's ability to drive. We know that that's not a problem and that anybody could drive with two and a half nanograms and be totally fine. But we want to prevent crime. So the best way to prevent crime is to make more of it. Um, they're creating a hybrid offense, which can be prosecuted summarily or by indictment, and the penalties will change depending on the method of prosecution. But also, it allows the prosecution a longer period of time to lay a charge, because for an indictable offense, there is no time limit. So they can lay it 10 years from now if they want. I mean, you'd probably have an argument that there was a big problem if they had the evidence all along, but if they didn't, um, then you could end up getting charged years down the road. Again, when you can't collect the evidence to defend yourself. And they're looking only for THC, which is a huge issue because there's about 113 different cannabinoids. THC is one of them. Another one that we hear a lot about is CBD. CBD is going to remain illegal. It will eventually be legalized, um, but it still remains illegal after uh, C45. The interesting thing about CBD is that it can mitigate the impairing effects of THC. So when you smoke or, or eat pot, the thing that makes you feel high and feel good um, is the THC. But CBD has all of these other effects. It's often used in the medical applications. It's uh, used for pain relief. It's used to control seizures. Um, it has all of these really important medical effects. And there's a lot of experimentation now that we've seen legalization in a number of states with CBD in conjunction with THC and how that can mitigate the impairing effects. There's even a recent BC Supreme Court case involving a man who was charged with breaching a probation condition. He had a condition not to be intoxicated in a public place. And there was something that happened and the police ended up getting a sample of his blood. And there was THC at a high concentration in his blood sample. 
and he argued successfully at trial that because he was taking a combination of THC and CBD, the CBD mitigated the impairing effects of the THC, and even though he had a lot of THC, he wasn't actually intoxicated, which is what he was prohibited from being. And the police never tested for CBD. It was unknown how much CBD was in his blood because they don't test for it. Well, also under C46 and after legalization, they're not going to be testing for CBD. So you could be smoking a strain of cannabis that had really high CBD concentrations, but also had a good amount of THC in it, but feel no impairing effects and still end up with a charge for being over the limit. And as I said, there's about 113 different cannabinoids. We don't know yet how all of those impact the impairing effects of THC. We know that THC is the main one that causes impairment, but because there are so many of them and because we don't know so much, because the science is not where it needs to be, uh, we're going to see people who are prosecuted um, who might not actually be posing any danger at all and perhaps could be more safer. I don't know. I don't want a person who's going to have a bunch of seizures driving around. I would rather a person who's not going to have a bunch of seizures drive around. But that's just me. The government seems to disagree. So there's no scientific foundation for limiting the um, testing of your blood or your urine sample to just THC or its metabolites. Um, and it's actually a big problem. There's also a limitation, I'm going to sneeze in a moment, um, so uh, a limitation on disclosure um, that you can get about your blood uh, and, and breath as well testing. The government is saying you're only entitled to certain information and nothing beyond that. So we're not even going to be able to defend people from my perspective because we can't get the scientific information underpinning how the testing was done to say that it was done reliably. Now the other thing about THC is that it doesn't just stay in your body and then disappear when your impairment ends. THC is stored in your body in your fat cells. And as those fat cells break down over time, whether you go on a diet or whether it's just a natural breakdown of fat cells as new ones are created, the THC is re-released into your bloodstream and the impairing effects don't come back with it. So you see high concentrations of THC. They did a study, I was talking to John Conroy, who's a very famous cannabis activist lawyer um, recently, and he was telling me about a study they did um, at when they closed a prison down. There was a prison a long time ago where you used to be able to smoke cannabis. And can you imagine? Um, it was probably a really calm prison. Um, the, uh, so they closed that one down and they moved the population to Matsqui Institution. And they did testing of these individuals to see their THC concentrations once they were put in a position where they were required to abstain from cannabis. And they found even three months after these people were off, off the pot that they were still coming back with high concentrations of THC in their system. It also doesn't break down stably over time. So there's no, like with alcohol, you see a decline at a consistent rate before you're down to zero. With THC, you can see a sharp decline, zero, and then a spike, and then zero, and then a spike, and then somewhere around a little while, and it just goes on for however long your body wants it go to go along for. So you don't see the same outcomes for THC in your, in your system, which is a huge concern because when you take the drug recognition evaluation that says if you're fine, it's cannabis, and then a blood or a urine test that is going to show THC because it's going to be in your system for a long time, depending on your body and your fat cells and how you consumed it um, and your tolerance and your frequency of use, you can end up having people who hadn't used cannabis for days or weeks who are then convicted on the basis of this. It's incredibly frightening and very, very concerning. You're, you, this law is trapping people who are going to be factually innocent and ultimately going to be giving them criminal records because it's not based in any good science related to cannabis or cannabis impaired driving. The drug recognition evaluation, I talked about that. Other thing that we have coming, and uh, this has been in the news a lot lately, is saliva testing for uh, the presence of certain drugs. And the federal government approved recently a device called the Dragger Drug Test 5000. Um, we actually own one at our office. I think the first people in Canada to get one other than the RCMP Forensic Lab. Um, so we have one, and it is hugely problematic. This device 
will function reliably in temperatures of 4 degrees Celsius, that's plus 4, degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius, which, you know, in Vancouver, that's not a huge concern. We're not below 4 very often, and maybe those days of the year we can just not use it. But we're not the rest of the country or even the rest of the province. There are lots of places right now that are below four. Um, last week I was in Philadelphia with a guy who lives in Saskatoon and uh, he was showing me pictures that his wife was texting him of his lawn which was covered in snow. Uh, and I was like, ha ha, because <laughs> I'm from Vancouver. Um, and, uh, and, but that's the reality for the majority of Canada, is these very cold temperatures a significant portion of the year. The result in cold temperatures is false positives and false negatives on the device, and both are equally problematic. From a you know, defense lawyer perspective, false positives is really bad because you're going to take people off the road, you're going to subject them to this flawed testing process at the police station, you're going to give them roadside driving prohibitions on the basis of these results. And then what? The, the test is unreliable and, and there's nothing you can do about it. False negatives are also a huge problem because if there are people who are identified as needing to be removed from the road, we should probably take them off the road. Um, the police need an effective mechanism to enforce the law as much as we need an effective way to defend ourselves from the violations of our charter rights and, and from the long reach of the arm of the state. And yet, uh, what we've got is incredibly flawed. So despite that temperature problem, um, the federal government went ahead and approved this device anyway. They did a study with this device in Norway, uh, where they tested in a controlled environment people who were dosed uh, with cannabis to see the frequency of false positives. And they found roughly 12.5% of the time it gave false negatives and 14% of the time it gave false positives for THC that wasn't in somebody's body. So a huge concern about wrongful arrest, a huge concern about public safety by this device. It was a, a significant rush to judgment in my opinion that's going to lead to constitutional litigation. And what we've seen as a result of these, these things that have been identified is municipal police forces who don't have to take their direction from the feds saying, mm -hmm. No, we're going to hold off on it. So roadside testing for cannabis is a significant concern. Uh, we're going to have provincial penalties for saliva testing, and those are everything I wanted to tell you about. And that's how you can reach me. <laughs> Thanks.